I thought I would start, uh, Gordon and George, uh, with you. I wondered if you could share with, with us um, your father's, what your father um, had to say um, over the years to both of you about his experiences during the war, during and after the war. I'm not a hero. What he said, though, if you weren't a hero, it rose Vallon. Rose Vallon was an employee in, the, in Paris in the Jeux de Pont. And the Nazis needed her to file, keep track of things, make lists. But of course, when she went home at night, she was not allowed to take anything, lists. What she did do was to memorize. And she went to the resistance, and then she wrote it all down, so at least in the movie, The Monuments Men, where that ledger comes out, that's for real. Um, it was a very important thing that she did, and it was a perilous thing that she did on a daily basis. Had she been caught, she would have been shot summar summarily. Um, and my father had a huge admiration for her because he understood exactly how nasty uh, some of the people that, uh, that she was uh, working with and had to greet Hermann Goering with her food periodically and choose for his collection. Um, one of the memories that my father has, and I'm holding here an interview which was made when he was, or a portion of him, um, when he was 94 years old, so it's a bit scattered. Um, it was in preparation for the movie, the documentary, The Rape of Europa, which is based on this book by Lynn Nicholas, which you probably know something about. And that is a very dense book, but if you want to know just about everything that happened, that's the book to, to read. Um, he recalls, he recalled um, uh, um, reports of Goering stamping through Le Jeu de Baum, because Goering was a big man, and as opposed to Hitler, who was a much more studied presence, a little lighter on the feet, a little more studied, whereas Goering would, would of course, grab. Um, I want to I stop talking here and, and just try to give you a flavor of my father's sense of humor because my father had a really good sense of humor. And I am really laughing at the, the, uh, the typescript of what came across from the tape recording of this three hour interview um, when he was 94. And, the, the typist apparently really didn't understand some of the stuff. <laughs> and so we get um, my father saying, I was in London while Myra Hess, the great pianist, was, doing, was, was playing at noontime in the National Gallery, which she kept up all through the war. And right in that building, and the building was shattered, and there was glass on the floor. But she played her last concert there, and I heard it, and I'll never get over it. She played the Beethoven, now this is where the typist comes in. Let's see, if you, let's see how smart you are. <laughs> you ready? She, she played the Beethoven N-A-P-A, C-E-A, new word, N-A-D-A. -A. His, most, his most famous Spanish <laughs> the Apachinada. Napachinada. I'll never get over it. The Beethoven Napachinada Sonata in an empty room of the National Gallery in London with glass on the floor. Um, he loved a good joke, and I'll tell you one right now. It's been so cold out that I saw a chicken crossing the road the other day with a cape on. <laughs> <laughs> that is the kind of joke in my father. <laughs> I just want to add one thing. Those of you who may have known him, he had always had a little red 
river and his lapel there. And what that stood for was the um, French Legion of Honor, which he had been given after his work um, in the restoration of these um, paintings and furniture and sculpture and what have you. And he didn't talk so much about it, but he never was without that. And I'm also quite aware that his dad also got, had the one this medal for him. He was a general in the First World War. So it was a it did double duty. He remembered his dad and also his work.
for their lumber and nails, or by surreptitious means, snooping, found sources for glass and roofing materials which had up to then escaped the notice and consequently the active control of other military authority. They were going underground, basically, going behind the backs. They had to do this. You only had so much um, material and you were charged with you know, trying, to, trying to do it. Some material could be obtained by less delicate maneuvering, he wrote, such as an evening in the officer's bar with the colonel whose signature would bestow a dozen rolls of tar paper roofing. Early in the game, we learned one thing could be traded for another. For example, a thousand pounds of nails could be had on the QT in exchange for 500 square feet of shoe leather, <laughs> which we could have if we could lay our hands on a tub of Rhine wine. And this could easily be secured for cash if we could let the wine merchant have enough of our nail credits to shoe his horses and roof his wine sheds. It was an alternative economy, certainly, and I think that's, he was interested in how to get it done. In the idealism of it, I can talk more about that, but the how to get it done was interesting. Dan. Um, I wanted to follow up with another question for you, Carol. I know that Chuck signed the Weiss Bottom Manifesto in 1945, refusing to have anything to do with the removal German-owned artworks uh, to the United States for safekeeping. Um, and I know that the Navy threatened many of the people who signed with um, court martial. And I wondered um, if Chuck talked about that, talked about what, what that meant, that refusal, and how much was at stake for him at the time. He did. Um, late in life, uh, it was a thing, can you all hear me? Is it, yeah. It was uh, what he said he thought the most important thing that had been accomplished at least that he'd been involved with, that had been accomplished during the so-called MFA and A uh, moment, was the signing of the Bispad Manifesto. And it was, I'd like to, actually, it's quite short. I'd love to read it, if that's possible. It's a moving document. Um, I think it was about 30, 27 or so of the uh, officers, who, of the 35 officers who were in uh, Germany, were able to get to Bispaden at this, at this moment. I, some of you may know what this is, but I can describe it a little bit, a little bit more. Um, were, they were called themselves together, as it were, because they had been um, ordered to ship 202, they mockingly referred to it as Westward Home Bateau, uh, 202 uh, paintings from, I think they were all paintings, from the German National Collection uh, to ship to the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. for protective custody. They thought that this was a terrible precedent, that they, in fact, had been sent to Germany to return art to the nations from which and the people from which it had been stolen. And this would be, even if under the, what they thought was a guise of caring for this work during the winter, they said, we know best what is able to happen here. We've been on the ground. Um, here we know the art can be very well protected uh, in the organizations that, have, or the, the um, buildings that have been set up, and the Germans are absolutely prepared uh, to, to take this. And I think there are various reasons that um, this happened. They had been working with, with, uh, with Germans uh, after the war to make this happen, with German Germans, to make, to, make this, uh, to make this all happen. But Chuck thought it really was the most important thing, and he, he's, he wrote, he's, in this 1946 lecture, he wrote a bit about that. But maybe I should um, read, uh, the Wiesbaden Manifesto. So they, they were ordered to do this, and they didn't, they didn't believe that it, was, uh, that it was right. So here is what it was. It was in November 1945. 27 or 28 of them were there. Six others either sent separate letters um, or agreed in principle to what had been written, decided not to sign, and they couldn't reach three because of the difficulties of, of correspondence. But it, really, there were, um, most of them were there. Let me read it. It was also written, Chuck said, that Bill Leslie, a man called Parker Leslie, sat down and, just, and wrote this. It wasn't hammered out. Uh, Bill Leslie sat down and wrote it. We, the undersigned, Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives Specialist Officers in the Armed Forces of the United States, wish to make known our convictions regarding the transportation to the United States of works of art, the property of German institutions or nationals, for purposes of protective custody. We are unanimously agreed that the transportation of those works of art undertaken by the United States Army upon direction from the highest national authority establishes a precedent which is neither morally tenable nor trustworthy. 
Since the beginning of United States participation in the war, it has been the declared policy of the Allied forces, so far as military necessity would permit, to protect and preserve from deterioration consequent upon the processes of war, all monuments, documents, or other objects, they didn't mention cows, of historic, artistic, cultural, or archeological value. The war can now be invoked for the further protection of the objects to be moved for the reason that de depots and personnel, both fully competent for their protection, have been inaugurated and are functioning. The allied nations are at present preparing to prosecute individuals at Nuremberg, right? right for the crime of sequestering, under the pretext of protective custody, the cultural treasures of German-occupied <coughs> countries. A major part of the indictment follows upon the reasoning that even though these individuals were acting under military orders, and these were military officers here signing this, the dictates of a higher ethical law made it incumbent upon them to refuse to take place in or countenance the fulfillment of these orders. As we know, they would have been shot, but nevertheless. We, the undersigned, feel it is our duty to point out that though as members of the armed forces, this was their, their escape clause, we will carry out the orders we receive, we are thus put before any candid eyes as no less culpable than those who, whose prosecution we affect to sanction. We wish to state that from our own knowledge, no historical grievance will rankle so long or be the cause of so much justified bitterness as the removal for any reason of a part of the heritage of any nation, even if that heritage may be interpreted as a prize of war. And though this removal may be done with every intention of altruism, we are nonetheless convinced that it is our duty, individually and collectively, to protest against it, and that though our obligations are to the nation to which we owe allegiance, there are yet further obligations to common justice, decency, and the establishment of the power of right not of expediency or might among civilized nations. Now, it's a beautiful piece. It's a beautiful document. Um, and there would be many who would argue that Germany was not at that moment a civilized nation of what had happened. And I, I, I wondered why did this particular group of men, were they, because they were working in the field and knew, and also had ideals about the role of art in the world. And I think it's that idealism that comes through. Now, they agreed to do it. However, they leaked it to Janet Flanner, uh, the New Yorker, who published it in the New Yorker. Eleanor Roosevelt read this, and suddenly it was only, oh, for an exhibition. Mm -hmm in the United States. Mm -hmm. But one thing was interesting to me, I found, uh, I never knew when Chuck, I'll stop in a minute, I feel like I'm going on way too long. Um, I never knew why Chuck didn't return to the National Gallery, why he, when he came back from the war, went to the Albright Knox Gallery. Andrew Ritchie offered him a job, another monuments person, I think that was it. I just thought he moved on. He um, wrote to the director of David Finley of the National Gallery, who had offered him his job back. They saved jobs um, during, during the war. And he said, I, I appreciate that very much, but I feel too strongly about the government and working for the government now. And so he turned his job down and actually even said this protective custody sounded like Nazis. David Finley wrote a four-page letter back about you foolish young man if you don't believe your own government to do the right thing. And Chuck didn't. He thought it was, it was wrong. He didn't know why exactly, where they thought that in fact museum directors who in, had indeed had spoken, it's come out since, about where this art would fit into our national collections. But that wasn't the plan, and they didn't, I don't think that was the reason. They just said, well, if it's going to come here, then fine, we will, we will take it in. But there were people in Treasury and in State who thought um, war, that reparations to the United States in the form of the German national collection should come to the United States, and that these men believe was, was wrong. Wow. So, Definitely. anyway, Incredible. it was interesting. Peter, Incredible could I, story. I add to that? Yes, please. Um, a question that was asked of my father in this interview. As an art historian spending your whole life helping people find the importance of art and joy in art, you must be proud of the effort that the Americans made in the war to safeguard. Enormously, said Pop, with one exception. What are we doing? sending a high order, even signed by President Truman, who really didn't know what he was doing. Too late, 
It had already happened. 202 pictures out of the finest German collection there is of paintings which were in the Berlin Kaiser Friedrich Museum. They were, of course, not in Berlin. They were in Washington. Well, first of all, they were in Wiesbaden, our northern collecting point. Um, and then, okay, he drifts a bit. And then later on, when the secret, you can't understand, you, you, you know you've got 202 German pictures in the cellars of the National Gallery in Washington. Why and how did they get there? And what are they, what are they going to be, what, what about all the rest? Well, finally, the secret gets out. And Truman finally understands. He countermanded the order. The order and said, these will be returned under American auspices, I guess. Um, they did this, and then it came out, well, since they're in Washington, surely they can be exhibited. I mean, let's let people see it. And so they thought they'd have an exhibition for about a week. Well, the first day they had something like 8,000 people there. And it was dangerous to the pictures, you know, and so lines began forming outside. And so it lasted for several months. I forget how many. In the meantime, I signed it. Not originally. I signed it, and so did 190 others. And the reason he didn't sign it before was that he was already home. Um, and almost everybody you know signed a citizen's request that this happen. For God's sakes, get these things back. This is terrible. It destroys the whole thing that they were, that the Monuments Men and what Pop was doing was, was, was uh, what they were trying to do. And one of the things my father said was that, you know, there was a lot of GI, American GI looting, a lot of it. He said, but that's different from institutional looting. And that's what he and, and, and Mr. Parkhurst felt about the fact that certain uh, museum directors and curators were perfectly willing to accept these 202 pictures and whatever else they could and put them into American uh, museums. And um, Chuck Parkhurst was outraged and so was my father. And thank God that things went back. Let me just, let me add a, f a few things here. Um, I have a condensed version of the um, um, what Dad was saying, and he said to his um, the person who's asking his questions, and you will ask, why didn't I sign it? I didn't know it was happening. I was already out of Germany and in London, partly sick and writing my report on Hitler's art collection, shot up on the top floor of a pub, writing this thing, putting it in order. Um, and let's see. Yeah, and I never heard about it until after it happened. Let me then jump down a little bit. I was put on the OSS art looting unit by Francis Taylor, head of the Met, who was a very good friend, brilliant mind, and so forth. Well, he put me on the art looting unit, and I had one of the great experiences of my life. So when I got back to Washington, I went up to New York as soon as I could to thank him. It was just the two of us. We had a lovely time, and then suddenly he said, I don't get it. You people in the field, you behave like a bunch of college sophomores. And I said, Francis, what are you saying? I don't get it. He said, well, my God, the way you behave when we brought these pictures over from Wiesbaden of Washington? I said, yes. Then he said, what the hell do we get out of this war? That in the end of the, is the end of the story and was the end of the friendship. that I would turn back the clock just a little bit to ask you some more about your father's, the original assignment, um, because your father's assignment was to really help document, as you just, as you just mentioned, um, the plan and scheme around how Hitler had, you know, was assembling the, this collection. And it was a really an extraordinary assignment. I wondered whether he talked about what that was like to do that work um, and then to think back on it later? I'll start. Um, he was the third person who was chosen for this group of three. And when he got there, the only job that was left was a um, report on collect uh, Hitler's collection. And he said, oh good, this is the one I wanted. So he, um, 
he was very pleased to do that. And, you know, as I say, he ended up in uh, um, London writing, writing this thing on the top of a, I just love the idea of his writing this report on Hitler's collection on the top of a pub in London. <laughs> Wild idea. Um, Hitler's collection was going to be housed in Linz, Austria, as you know. And he describes Linz as this, this rather beautiful plaza leading to the river, um, forget which river it was, and then across the river, across the bridge, there is a hill, and up there was going to be what Pop called Hitler's Acropolis. And in the meanwhile, of course, lots and lots of fancy buildings are actually not very fancy in the Nazi architecture, which was, he called it kind of stripped down classicism, um, fascist, fascist architecture. Um, he also remarked the, one of the few buildings in, in um, Munich that should have been bombed was, was the Haus der Kunst, which the, the House of German, uh, the Deutsche Kunst, um, uh, the House of German Art. Um, and then he went on to say, um, well, of course, we have a fair amount of that kind of architecture in our own country. Just go look at the State Department building and you'll know exactly what the House der Kunst looks like. <laughs> He wasn't very complimentary about that. Um, one of the things that, that um, well, that, let me get to your question, Tina. Um, his job was to interrogate. Um, and the, the place of, of much of this interrogation was in a high Austrian town called Alt Aussee, um, way up in the mountains, a beautiful lake, very near the salt mines, of um, where a good deal of the art um, had been stored. Um, a little story about that. There was one man who was going to execute the order from the Fuhrer to blow the whole mountain up um, if, it if it turned out that the Allies were getting too close. And the, I guess the reason that that mountain was not blown up containing the Michelangelo and God knows what else was that the people who worked at the salt mines said, wait a minute, you know, I'm not sure they were thinking about the art, but what they were thinking about the, was their livelihoods. And so what they did was to blow up the entrances to the mines so that uh, um, you know, the, the dirty work could could not be done. And my father, who very seldom, at least in my hearing, criticized people, um, he was a very gentle man. In a lecture that I heard him give, um, he said, you have my permission to hate that man, that man who was going to blow up the mountain, because everything would have gone up. And, all right, well, he, he he interrogated a lot of people, um, and then I'm, later on he saw some, some people in, in, in the 1950-51 time. But among them was perhaps the chief, con well, one of the chief conf um, um, confiscators whose name was Muhlmann, M-U, with an umlaut, H-L-M-A-N-N, uh, -N, I believe. Um, and again, in this interview, he says, this was a dyed-in-the-wool Nazi. And he said, my, my father asked him, uh, do you still believe in this? And he said, absolutely I do. And my father said, well, at least he had the honesty to say so. Um, it didn't make me respect him, um, except for his honesty, because I loathed his, his, his politics. But he went on to say that Moomin gave him a lot of information about where things were, what had happened. Um, and as, um, as, as Pop said, um, I think what he was trying to do was to decrease the time that he would have to spend in jail um, later on. But there was a huge fund of information that came from this man. Um, 
others, um, I'm, I'm not certain who a lot of these other people uh, uh, were. Um, there was, there was a, um, 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 a Munich art dealer, um, a woman who sold Hitler a lot of, of, um, of um, paintings, some of them dreadful, um, some of them, I imagine, quite valuable. Um, but he went to her, this was in Munich, I guess, he went to her um, shop and demanded the papers, and she, she raised holy hell about this, um, but he said, I can call the police if you like, but I will have the, the papers. Now, one of the things you have to understand about Pop at this time is, of all people to wear a revolver, he had one. <laughs> I don't know whether he hit the broad side of a barn, but, but, uh, and we don't know whether it was loaded, but my father carrying around a pistol is not a memory that I, that I can imagine. Um, at a certain, yeah, please. Yeah. For those of you who've seen Monuments Men, you know the, that early part where they're doing the basic training and these people are wandering around saying, what do you do with a gun? Well, that describes that. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was, well, Pop, as, as Gordon has said, he was responsible for writing up the, 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 the um, intentions to build the Hitler collection for Linz, Austria. Um, and all the architectural stuff that was going to be built and what was going to go into it. And the, the eventual report that he wrote is, I don't know, somewhere between two or 300 pages, and it's in the National Archives. And probably, I um, imagine you can, you can access it. But it, it is there. And Gordon's right. Um, uh, uh, Pop said, you know, I got the really good job of, um, of you know, good. Um, I got the really interesting job of, of cataloging and finding the motivation as to why this man, um, what, was he, what he was intending to do. And of course, part of it was getting back at Vienna, uh, because Vienna had turned him down as an art student um, way back when. And so he was going to show Vienna by housing the greatest collection of, of all um, in, in, in Linz. And it would, of course, come from various locations across Europe. Uh, one of the things that he did say um, in this interview is that this is really the first time in history that the whole idea of art restitution came about. That, as he said, had Napoleon been forced to divest France of all the stuff that had been brought out of Italy, the Louvre would be out of business. <laughs> so here we are in the 20th century in this ghastly war, but for the first time, this, this kind of crime against human civilization was taken seriously, and that the spoils of war were not just up for grabs. They had to go back. And he believed that. Let me add that he was also very proud of the fact that it was primarily an American idea. The British also were involved, but essentially it was an American idea to do that. He was very proud of that. I wondered if I could ask a one more question, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. And that is about the impact, and it's really to all three of you, of these experiences on both men's subsequent long careers as museum directors and arts professionals. Um, what did it mean to have, to have done this work for their later thinking and work? You know, it's interesting. I, I've thought about that. I, I wondered, in, one of the things in, in preparation for this, is a little um, aside to that question, is that Chuck had been at uh, Biltmore House in, in North Carolina, where the National Gallery had evacuated its paintings during the war. So he was aware of you know, where paintings were, how paintings were evacuated, and the idea of, of the threat to art during uh, the consequences of war. So that was sort of preparation. It was a great story, too, that he used to tell about finding the proper temperature and humidity control in the wine cellar and piping it up in Biltmore House. 
but I think you did. I think the combination of idealism that they brought into this uh, and that they were able to to enact during uh, the um, during the, the process of MFA and A and, and the Wiesbaden Manifesto and the administrative the, the how do you do it? How do you accomplish it? How do you get this stuff done? Where do you get the Jeep? Can you make the Jeep run? Um, you know, all those sorts of things. Where do you find the nails? How do you trade for this? Chuck was both um, an idealist and a practical man. And I think conservation, which was always at the heart of what he did. He founded the Intermuseum Conservation Lab at Oberlin when he was at Oberlin College. He founded the National Gallery's Conservation Lab when he went to the National Gallery. And here, he used to talk about himself as being the utility outfielder in Williamstown, and he ran the <laughs> conservation lab for a while in between, uh, in between directors. So I think it had a big effect on his, uh, on his, his life and the way in which he uh, envisioned the care of collections, um, the care of collections. Um, I know that the friendships that he developed out of this were crucial to him. Chuck Parkhurst, Andrew Ritchie, James Lorimer, uh, a host of other people. Um, that it's not something, of course, that when they got together they necessarily talked about. Um, they had more contemporary things to talk about. But I know that, that behind that was an experience that they all had that um, was a bond, it drew them together. And it meant, considering the document that you've read, um, it meant disbanding certain friendships because of what had happened with that but it meant strengthening other ties um, with people who were of the same mind um, and believed so deeply in what this restitution um, was intended to do. Even though um, we know that much was lost during the war, either because it's still not found, and that is also the case, or because it was simply destroyed, which is a horrible thing, but um, it happened. And Pop, I remember, bemoaning. He'd say, bring out a book. He says, look at it. It doesn't exist except here in this book. And this was you know, a deeply unsettling thing to him, that war and greed had destroyed things that were very, very beautiful and meant, you know, at the heart uh, uh, to him. But I think the, the depth of the friendships that, that they all developed was um, really significant. I'd like to add that it also gave Dad a second career because when after the war, no one wanted to hear about this. Uh, he offered to write some articles, I think, for the Atlantic or... Maybe it was, Chuck, it was Chuck who was going to do that. I can't remember. But anyway, there were ideas of writing articles about the experience, and no one wanted to publish it. Yeah. So the whole issue sort of died for about 30 years. And then suddenly, people started to get interested again. And he was, it seemed like every other week, there would be a team with uh, television cameras coming to interview him mean, from Japan, from Austria, from Germany, from heaven knows where. And he, was, he really got into it and uh, was, was spoke at Bard, I remember. Um, he just, I mean, actually, <laughs> he gave a series of small lectures about this uh, experience. He did it in Brattleboro. He did it up in, up in Maine and many other places um, for small, small groups and really enjoyed it. Well, why don't we turn the questions over to the audience, and I think there is a mic. Is there a mic? No. So, just speak up if you have questions. Yes. I just want to, not so much a question as a comment, as a movie, I saw many, many years ago, all the train, 
Yes, maybe some of you can call it. It was about French partisans diverting. The whole movie is about constantly diverting this train that the Nazis had loaded with French artillery. <coughs> and the final scene, I'll never forget it, was that the, the Germans, the Nazis, were the train fighting came to a stop for the end movie. They just threw these things on the countryside, just lying on the hillside. And it was Burt Lancaster, who was the career of the movie, uh, he, he machined on the Nazis who were like that, so he had this picture of the, the, the our treasures lying on the ground and the Nazis beside them. So it was a very, very clever movie. Is anybody here else here see? There's some cinematic license in that uh, movie, as you probably know. Yes. <laughs> um, there was a train. Um, but it wasn't, um, you know, sent down to you know different places. Apparently, what the resistance had done was to um, find ways to sabotage the trains. So it would go a couple of miles and then it would stop. So it never got to its uh, destination. Incidentally, the director of that uh, movie is a Williams graduate. Oh, really? Who's the director? Uh, Frank and I. This reminds me. Maybe the only story that. Um heard Chuck Talley told it in public uh, was about the burgers of Calais, thinking about works being tossed by the side and coming across the burgers of Calais when, um, that had been dumped in the woods uh, in the snow. This also was preceded when he, he said one thing he really admired, I think, the friendships were incredibly important. And he so admired the way in which uh, enlisted men and people who had not had any, some had not had any experience with art took to this cause very powerfully. And one to, he described one, I guess it was at Al to see someone coming, uh, a soldier coming with a flashlight, and it was seeing a chronic Adam and Eve, and said, it's a nude, it's a nude, it must be art. It must be art. <laughs> <laughs> the kind of excitement of, of that. <laughs> But the opposite was when he didn't recognize art himself. He was wa walking through the woods. He'd left his Jeep behind. He was going up to um, Neuschwanstein, the castle in the snow up on a hill, a, a mountain, really. And he said, they, he, I, can't, I can't describe it the way he did. He said, a group of men standing around. They weren't moving much. And if they were talking, we couldn't hear them. We were a little nervous. What were they doing? What was happening? He didn't recognize until a bit later that it was Rodin's Burgers of Calais that had been dumped in the woods because too heavy. What he didn't say then, that he had to figure out how to get it down back to the railroad uh, and, and out back to France. It was the Rothschild, um, the Rothschild cast of, uh, of the Burgers of Calais. But in, in that case, he told stories on himself, not being able to, uh, to recognize, uh, recognize. You know, there was one, one day when um, Gordon and I were invited by my father to the Königsplatz in the middle of Munich, where the, the, the big office was. And he said, I want you to see this office because you will never see another office like it. And I seem to remember this one better than Gordon does. But uh, in any case, um, we were invited into Dad's office, which was sort of across the street from where Hitler's had had his. And lined up against the walls, stacked like this, picture after picture after picture, and on the walls, I know there was a Watteau, I remember that name, and there may have been a Rembrandt and a Rubens. Well, that's a hell of an office. <laughs> and and he, said, he said, these are not mine. I want you to know that. <laughs> we, were ten, we were 10. I was 10, he was 12. Um, these are not mine. These are going, we hope, back to the owners if we can find them. And they are yours, however, for the next five minutes, or however long <laughs> you wish to stay and look at them. Questions? Yeah. Yes, hi. Uh, there are other in the Holocaust Institute in Rhode Island. Uh, a little sidebar. I, I met your dad years ago. He was a fine gentleman. Uh, a little sidebar story, local. It kind of comes in on the backside here. Uh, this past fall, I was given a phone call by a local antique dealer appraiser to come over on Cole Avenue, just off of Cole Avenue here, uh, to look at an estate to identify, because I'm a noted third right historian and collector, uh, Hitler's signatures on documents and stuff that were recently found in this house. It was there, and I went all over. Unfortunately, they were not originals, they were auto pen copies. But what was fascinating to find out was a gentleman who had just passed 
Uh, his second wife was Herman Goering's court, uh, the daughter of Herman Goering's court artist. And within the house was 50 of his paintings. This is less than a mile from where we're sitting right here. Right now. Uh, he was noted for doing hunting scenes, if you, because Goering was the minister of the hunt. And if you were a diplomat and you went off on a hunt with him, he presented you a scene with, of a deer, stag, or whatever, and killed that thing. And, uh, but this was 50 of them were, were, were framed and just not more than a mile from him. I'd like to add just one, one more thing, too, uh, that I've been thinking about what mattered. And people, people mattered. Art mattered a lot, and people mattered more. And one letter that I came across to Chuck was uh, from, some of you may know the, the name, Hans Schwarzenski, who was a curator at the Boston Museum. And his wife, Mia, a dancer, uh, had a brother who was a curator in Berlin. And she had just heard, this was 1946, she had just heard that her brother had survived and his, and his wife had survived. But they had been separated. They had sent their daughter away and they had been separated from her. And Mia wrote to Chuck and said, you're there, um, can you search for her? She's seven years old, here's her name, here's what she looks like. She's been separated from her parents for five years. And it, it's an incredible letter saying, you know, can you do this? I had no, I, I googled her. She graduated from the University of Michigan in 1961. So apparently she was reunited and she survived the war. But those were the, we think about the art that was lost, but the people, um, and not only asked to find cows and to organize cows, but to find seven-year-old girls seems to me um, incredible. So, sort of the moment of the war had many, many, many terrible moments. Light-hearted moments, skiing, things that they were diversions of the erotic literature and Neuschwanstein, or lots of things that were uh, that were light-hearted, but the seriousness of it all was what um, was a terrible balance. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the pieces that were plundered from established institutions of art are ultimately returned because of the recording that was uh, diligently uh, supported and held. But what about that came from private collections, uh, those that are not alive any longer because of the Holocaust and, or other ways of dying. Where did those pieces go? They went first back to the country from which they were taken. Um, if there was no way to, I think most, you have, first of all, you have to understand that there were thousands of objects that had to be dealt with, including cows, I guess. <laughs> um, but they went back to the country of origin and were housed in national museums. And that's what's happening in right now. Some of these things are being traced, even though the, the owners of the, at the time are long since dead. Some of their descendants may have evidence, you know, photographs of the old house with a courbet on the wall. And there was an article in the New York Times about that recently. And that's one of the reasons why uh, uh, there have been problems with, with uh, loans to, to this country because uh, people in or museums in Europe are a little afraid that uh, people will say, well, listen, that belongs here and that it will be you know, quarantined until, until it is. But, yeah, there are still things from private collections distributed around European museums that have not been dealt with properly, as I understand it, because really the museums don't want to lose them. Other complication is sometimes all the members of the families were destroyed, and those those uh, pictures would remain in the in the in the country and presumably in the museums. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one final question, if there is one. Yes. You know, have there been any uh, efforts by our government and, and army as of leaving Afghanistan and Iraq to <clears throat> keep an eye out for the many things from that area and that the ancient civilizations there? I'm not. I haven't heard or read anything about that. I know very little about that, but I have read something in the Monuments Men. Uh, uh, what do they call it? Um, magazine. News, newsletter. 
And apparently very little is being done from what I gather. It's been kind of shocking that this has not carried through in the same force and zeal that it was during World War II. And the order from Eisenhower to troops landing in Italy was you will be faced with monuments, works of art, of extreme cultural value. Um, you are to protect as much as possible, considering this is a wartime situation, those things, those buildings, whatever they happen to be. Um, that is, you know, it's a direct order and it's um, written. When we went into Iraq, um, there was no such order from Mr. Um, what's his name, the Secretary of Defense. Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld, right. And when it, was, when it was determined that awful things were happening to Iraqi treasures, um, his reaction, as I understand, was stuff happens. It wasn't stuff, though, that he said. Well, I'd like to thank our three panelists for tonight's program. <laughs>